All right, well, you, you switched from the headset and you've gone to the handheld mic now, okay? okay. I did. All right. Uh, well, first off, thank you everybody for coming in from various locations to join us. So in this uh, panel, we're gonna talk about corporate accelerators and try and get a little bit under the covers and beyond the brochures and, and figure out what really goes on there. Um, so I'm actually gonna try and speak the least on this and hand it over right to the panel now. Uh, just a quick introduction of your program and why it was set up. Sure. Anything. Hello everyone, so I lead innovation for GE in Canada. Our program is based out of Calgary. It's focused on industrial IoT. Um, what we get out of it is changing our innovation culture inside GE. So you heard previous speakers talk about how corporates are starting accelerators, not, not necessarily to make money, but really change our innovation culture and also accelerate our path to market so we don't get disrupted. So that's what we get out of it. What the startups get out of it is really access to the 7,000 customers who walk through our innovation center every year in Calgary, um, go to market capabilities. We actually, a uh, week on mentoring, we just partner up with them directly on specific industry challenges and go to market together. And uh, that's the benefits the startup get out of it. They grow into big companies. I'm, I'm Ravi, I direct Alchemist. We're an accelerator for B2B startups, as was mentioned earlier. Um, we have five VCs who are LPs, and then we have 11 corporates, including GE Digital, which is on, on the West Coast. Um, they funded an industrial internet program, and so everything that was said about GE is also relevant for our industrial IoT program. The other big benefit is, is that there's synergies, so like on industrial IoT, we have besides GE, we also have Siemens, Cisco, um, SAP, Johnson Controls, Analog, who are all interested in industrial IoT. So I think what's unique about Alchemist as an approach to corporate innovation is that because we have a syndicate of corporate partners, there's a lot of cross synergy, which is neat um, across the corporates. And then for our founders, ultimately we exist to just attract and be a magnet for the best founders. So we first serve the founders, and then the corporates know that they benefit from the ecosystem that evolves around that. Uh, so I'm with Johnson & Johnson Innovation. How many here are in the health space or health tech space? Oh, we got two over there. You are the most important people here. Yeah. Uh, so we started J Labs uh, on a basic premise that great science and technology is just as likely to come from outside the walls of a big company like J&J is inside, in fact, probably more likely. Uh, but when it's out there on their own in the life sciences, they face so many hurdles to actually become a viable commercial entity to take uh, solutions to patients, a bit different than in the tech space, that many times things fail before they even have a chance to get there. So our job is to take down those hurdles and help those science and technology companies get to market. So we do that through three different ventures. One is J Labs. At J Labs, we have uh, 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 two different programs. One are their educational programs where we're uh, trying to help educate and empower and enable those scientists to create companies in the first place. Um, and so we do networking events and funding series and, and workshops. Um, but we also have a physical space in our different locations whereby companies can get the same platform of resources that our internal R&D programs have. So we'll have a 40,000 square foot space. We'll have uh, $5 million worth of capital equipment. Those companies will have individual wet lab and dry lab and office modules where they can have access to all of those facilities. They'll have an operations team and a business services team that can help with everything like getting that company started and off to the races. And they can also help them on the operational side. And so our goal is to get companies started quickly and easily and affordably, which is very different in the life science space than in the tech space. And uh, in contrast to what you guys were doing in GE, we were really trying to get out there and get companies started. And our unanticipated benefit was that we started changing our culture inside of J&J. Uh, made a tremendous difference when you get to ride along with these entrepreneurs. Okay, so we're gonna stay with Melinda on this one. With, um, quick question, do you take and hold the intellectual property of the com companies that come in or do they own it free and clear? Okay, hell no, uh, just to be very clear. Uh, so we are a no strings attached model. So I was an entrepreneur, actually started this model on my own and was um, 
uh, brought in as a partner with J and J to do this, and then and then um, acquired by J and J. And so my heart belongs with entrepreneurs. And as an entrepreneur, you don't want people to take your equity before you have a chance to build it yourself. So our goal is to help those entrepreneurs build value first, to maintain freedom. And our benefit is we get to work with you along the way. And as we get to know each other, then we decide if we want to partner. But not until you've had a chance to, to make it the best that you can be. And on our side, that's a benefit because it decreases our risk to partnering with that company. So Great. we do it a little differently than yep. your typical accelerator. Good, good. Uh, Ravi, maybe two parts, same thing. What is the what is the model that you use for the startups when they come in? Are they giving anything up? Or are you, they getting investment? And then at the same time, can you tell us about um, an, a notable outcome or a notable company or some of the crazy stuff that you're seeing come through? So um, we, so our default is that we give thirty six thousand uh, dollars for five percent of equity uh, into the into the companies. There's also around half a million dollars of perks, and the thirty six thousand dollars is intended to just pay for rent in San Francisco, which is obscenely expensive. But we sort of view it as us as being a co-founder with the companies when they're starting out. Um, in terms of things that might be in, of interest here, how many people here are coming from the corporate side? How many people are from a corporation thinking about innovation? And how many people are in an accelerator or running an accelerator? Okay, so we mainly have accelerator operators. I think what's really fun in terms of like really juicy questions are where there when there's a conflict between the corporate and the accelerator or the founder. And that's probably what we want to sort of discuss. So we've had 15 acquisitions. Um, about uh, two, for example, we've had Cisco, who's one of our original LPs and one of our biggest LPs. The reason why they've funded us now four times is because they've acquired two companies. Okay, now when that happens, it's very bittersweet. Because I don't want Cisco necessarily to get to acquire the companies because I feel like that we're leaving a ton of money on the table. But the reason why Cisco is partly joining, is funding us, is because they're hoping to have some impact, real impact, in, ter in terms of their uh, business. So, so I'm just I'm actually going to jump in on this particular yeah. point. So for your stakeholders, yeah. what is success for them? Are they trying to get in and acquire these companies on the cheap? Is that why they're partnering with you? Yes. I, I, I mean, if I'm honest. Uh, y y yes, they're trying to. Well, they're trying to get an inside track onto trends, and then when they see a trend that's really exciting and interesting, then their corp dev team is going to get involved, and their corp dev team wants to get it. Uh, they they want to justify an ROI. So, as an example, we had in a company called Assemblage, two 26-year-old Danes had never been to the United States. They uh, got accepted into Alchemist. They joined Alchemist in August. And they demoed in January, and they got acquired by Cisco in February. Cisco got to know them in September, and so they were sort of tracking their progress. And so when they demoed, there was a bunch of corporates that were interested, but Cisco put a no-shop clause in and said, hey, two 26-year-olds, we're going to give you enough money where you never have to work again for the rest of your life if you don't want to. And um, it was enough for them to say yes. But it was frankly not, you know, I, I would argue that they were actually leaving a lot of money on the table and that could have become a much bigger company. But they're both very, very happy. They both have made, you know, it, um, they, they both have made millions where they don't need to work if they don't want to again. But there's a conflict there because I, you know, and, and, and this happened again a second time. We had another company that Cisco acquired. And when this happens, I know it because the founders suddenly go silent. They suddenly stop talking to us. And we're like, what's going on? And it's like, oh, we can't talk, we can't talk. And then four weeks later, it pops up that they signed this thing. And, 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 and so for, for me, as an accelerator, my LP is Cisco. The way that Cisco is justifying doing a fourth investment into Alchemist is not because of our, even if our fund is a 10x return, it does not move the needle on Cisco, OK? Because Cisco is such a big behemoth. The way things move the needle for Cisco is if they do something that drives meaningful revenue to their core business through a partnership. Um, or an acquisition. So that's where there's, sorry, I, those are like the juicy details. The crazy companies, crazy crazy companies that we've done, we did a quantum computing company, which you know they went out on stage and said, we want to kill Intel. Okay, and Intel was there in the audience. Um, and that company, has, um, they've raised $64 million. The last round's valuation was $200 million. And I hope they will kill Intel. Okay, so, and, and, and so that's part of my business is to kill the very companies that are our partners. Um, we have a company right now that's building an antimatter platform to try to go to Mars. Okay, crazy company. It's a bunch of ex SpaceX guys, but those companies where the where the founders have such a big vision that they're outside the scope of the corp dev teams 
you know, five verticals that they're looking to build competencies around are the ones that actually I think are really exciting. Sorry. No, that, that's, that's great. Cool. Uh, get deep in. Similar uh, question over to you. What is the model that uh, is used in the program? And fair disclosure, we uh, are partnered with GE on, uh, on the program in Calgary. But what is the business model? Um, and then what is your motivation within GE? Sure. So the, the business model is pretty straightforward, right? GE is in pretty much every single industrial vertical you can think of. We have a ton of challenges. Our customers are constantly bringing us problems that aren't exactly timed with our business planning cycles. And so to be able to move really fast, you have to look outside of your four walls to innovate. And so we have a very clear um, needs matrix that we are out looking for in terms of support technology. Um, and we are constantly reaching out through Zone Startup Calgary, our partner Rise and Futures, to find the best startups in the world who can come in. The minute they come in, what they walk into is an innovation ecosystem, right? Because we've got our engineering teams there, we've got uh, our sales and commercial teams there for all our business verticals, all living in one ecosystem, and we've got 7,000 customers who walk through there who are constantly seeing demo technology that they want to take to pilot right away. So the typical business model is a customer comes to us with a challenge, then we partner up with the specific startup that has been brought into the ecosystem to go to market together. Typically, the startup either has a sensor technology or an artificial intelligence algorithm. We've got a certain component of the technology and package it together in one solution and go to market together. And it's very flexible. The startup can be in front or GE can be in front, whatever works best for the customer. And there's a very clear revenue sharing model and the startup own their IP. Even if GE helps them cultivate and mature that IP, that IP belongs to the startup. Because the easiest way to kill any of that is to take out that, that IP from them. So when, when we started in the early days, I'll kind of peel the onion back a little bit. Um, I think one of the last negotiation points that we went through was around um, a very, very short window of uh, sort of right of first refusal or offer. So there's no lockup on the IP, uh, but you know, running the program, we wanted absolutely no restriction whatsoever on anything that the company would ever do. And so we pushed to shrink the window down to the smallest number possible uh, because we thought it was going to be a huge uh, you know, hurdle for the companies to get over. Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about how that's evolved over the last 12 months. Absolutely. I mean, listen, uh, GE has put these kinds of innovation centers, accelerators out there because it's really to fight the immune system of what is a big company and how we typically behave, which is badly when it comes to innovation, right? It's the standard stage-gated process for innovation. Idea goes through one and comes out the other three years later. Market's left. Everything's changed. And we're not selling the products we want to sell. So. It's important for us to work with these startups. I treat the startups like they are my customers. They might see it differently, but I see them as my customers. And so it's important that if we're really there for ecosystem impact, that these companies are able to grow and add value just like what you said. So we completely removed any clauses. So there's no rofers in any of these guys. The pipeline is open. If a competitor came in to take one of them after we've worked with them, that's fine. Um, and I feel like that's the ecosystem we're already living in. And big corporates have to change the way they engage these startups if you really want to enable the way you innovate internally and also impact the ecosystem the way we should be. Uh, Melinda, can you uh, highlight a, a story of a startup that came through that uh, really stood out in terms of the model? Or if you were to go back and say, this, look, here's a perfect example of how this stuff works. Um. Sure. Um, I'll give you an example of a company that got started, and I will tell you that we've seen this time and time and time again. I mean, they're kind of an extreme example, but it gives you an idea. Uh, so we uh, had J-Labs come to San Diego, and there was these two young guys who were working with a bigger company in the in the San Diego area who always wanted to have a big impact for patients, but they were kind of stuck in a big company. And you know, you kind of just move the needle a little bit, a little bit. And they always wanted to start a company, but never thought they could. So for 15 years, they like just talked about it. Until we came to San Diego and they started coming to our educational programs and they started believing that they could do it too. So they quit their jobs with $40,000 between the two of them. 
and they started a company. And they came to San Diego, or came to J Labs, and we accepted them not because they were in a strategic area of interest for us, but because they were very bright, passionate guys, and we wanted to see them get to the patients. So they wanted to work in rare diseases and in a particular technology platform. Uh, but we set them up with coaching because they'd never done anything like this before. And we said, listen, you want to do this and you want to do that, but you only have a year with the amount of money you have, so you need to do A, B, and C. So they went into the labs and they worked like crazy and they came back and said, listen, we think we got it. And so we set up an agreement with them, no strings attached, no money. We just said, we'll validate the data if the data is true. And it was indeed true, and they were able to take that to the bank. They raised $13 million. They hired a bunch of people. They kept working on the technology, and one day I decided to give them a platform to talk to our R&D heads. Well, one of our R&D heads put up his hand and said, listen, this is exactly the technology I've been looking for. I've been negotiating with two companies. We're, we're talking about 700 to a billion dollar deal. And now here's these two guys with this technology, exactly what we were looking for in hepatitis B. Hepatitis B is one of the most debilitating, deadliest diseases in the world, and you can't fix it because there are a thousand variants of the, of the strain. So you have to find a technology that hits all the variants. It's impossible these guys had the variants. So we ended up doing a multiple hundred million dollar deal with these guys. These guys came to us and I said, listen, we're still passionate about rare diseases. So we said, listen, we'll help you figure out what you should um, make your technology do for which rare disease. We worked with them on that. Six months later, they did a $1.6 billion deal. So they went from quitting their jobs with $40,000 to $2 billion worth of deals in two and a half years. What's the name of the company? Two and a half years, Arcturus. Okay. Yeah. That is tech time in life sciences. And listen, if you've ever been a patient before, which I have, which is how I got into the industry, I used to be in tech. Um, and when you become a patient, you realize that it takes you eight to 12 years to get a drug to market. And suddenly you get really passionate about the fact that you want drugs to get to market. And when you realize it takes that long, you want to speed it up. And that was my goal, to speed it up. And now we have companies getting to $2 billion worth of deals, just deals, in two and a half years. That's amazing. That's great. That's great. Let's go to the goal. And when people ask us what accelerator is, in particular with a corporate accelerator, it's shrinking that time that the company takes to either get there or crash into a brick wall, stop and pivot and do something new. What I think is most exciting about what we all do is that these two guys thought they were ordinary Joes. In fact, the CEO's name of Arcturus is Joe, right? And you can turn them into successful entrepreneurs by getting the experience, the wisdom, the resources of a big company. Because a lot of people in big companies, they're no dummies. Let me tell you, those are really smart people. To get into a big company is hard. But they prefer a lifestyle where you have a steady, stable, salaried employment relationship. Doesn't mean they don't know what they're talking about. They've actually seen a lot. They've actually done a lot. And now if you put together those seasoned, experienced employees with a big company with these entrepreneurs, well, magic happens. So that's why I think entrepreneurship is just as likely to happen in a place like here in Montreal or anywhere outside of Silicon Valley in Boston as in those places if you get the formula right. And it's really about making those people believe that they can do it too. Great. Ravi, how much influence do your partners have and who you onboard when you're selecting your companies? Do they have you know, veto rights on it? Do they tell you, here's our business challenges? How do you go about finding people you think are going to be good fits for your partners? So we do, check, we separate church and state in the decision-making process where the partners don't get to choose because we uh, want to keep it as a, a, an objective process. Uh, the, our big philosophy is, is that we need to be the magnet where the top founders, the founders are, are the core. And I think, every, I think any good program that you'll see, there is that respect and reverence for founders. Um, and, and our backers know that if we taint that process, but we're not choosing the best founders, but we're choosing the founders that are strategics or our corporate partners like because of some strategic mandate, then we lose that magnet. So what we do is, um, one is that when we have a program, like GE has funded our industrial IoT program, there is a chair of that program that is mutually decided by GE and us. So it's Tim Chu, Tim is a professor at Stanford and he's um, one of the thought leaders on industrial IoT. He chairs the Alchemist process, he makes the decisions and he's, a, a Switzerland between GE and Alchemist. 
Um, and then what we do is we know what uh, our corporate partners care about and we check in with them every four months to make sure that the, qu the companies are relevant to them and we do a lot of demand generation events so that we're trying to get a lot of applications in the areas that our corporate partners care about with the hope that the objective screening committee will naturally then choose companies that are in line with what our corporates care about. But we, we, we intentionally separate church and state and then we check in every four months to make sure that we're tracking with our corporate partners. So that's, that's how we've done it, yeah. Great. Um, I'm just looking at the time here, and I'm going to see right now, actually, if there's any questions we have from the audience. I've got a bunch of additional ones, but if anybody's got anything, I'm willing to, uh, to take them. Otherwise, I have some more. Uh, Gandeep and, oh, yeah, in the back. Ted, I've never seen you ask a question at any <laughs> conference I've ever been to. This is Ted Graham from GM. Um, so every once in a while, we So for those that didn't hear us, how do we, you know, help manage, uh, you know, the startups and being told not to engage with the big, slow industries? And maybe get even. We'll start with you yeah. on that one. Not that I'm saying I get that every time. Slow. No, no, no. That that happens to us all the time. So, uh, and and you know, I think the the reputation comes from GE tends to own IP and is very protective about its IP. So you've got founders who are very worried that their young startups or investors that their startups are going to walk into a situation where GE lawyers are going to get in front of our scientists. And, and so that's what I'm paid to not do. And that's what I'm paid to do, to provide air cover so that the immune system that I spoke about inside GE is deflected. And that's why we have the Innovation Center. So every single startup we talk to typically comes in not trusting this global brand that is GE. And for employees inside the company, that's bewildering. They just don't understand how come these guys don't trust us. Where to help them? Well. I think history will speak for itself. So it's actions that matter. So we bring them inside. We show them the other startups. We show them the customers we're working directly with. We show them how commercial deals are done. We show them how, in a lot of cases, GE is the first to validate that technology inside our own business and how even though we're paying for that company to build out their IP, test it and validate it, that company gets to keep all their IP and that company gets to sell to anyone else they want to as well. Because the benefit for us is our ability to solve our own internal challenges much faster than trying to do it on our own. And so just opening up the kimono and sharing what we have done today and showing real examples is a great way of winning uh, new startups over. It was very challenging at the beginning. It took a lot of work to convince startups that there truly was a ecosystem impact motive here. Because um, we're- So if you were to point to, here comes a softball question. If you were to point to you know, a, a big success so far in the year and a half that things have been up and running, what would you point to? I, it, I would point to a number of startups, but, but the first startup that we have, they, they called Viram. They're one of the first that joined us. It was two separate companies that as they started to pitch to the customers coming through the innovation center, so an opportunity to join together. And so they're in the business of eliminating rework across capital projects. For those of you who don't know, capital projects, you're easily wasting up to a trillion dollars globally a year, whether it is um, errors in design, errors in logistics, errors in construction, you name it. Across the board, there's a ton of waste there. And GE uh, is in the business of refurbishing hydro turbines, for example, in the middle of nowhere. And so guess what? Very conservative company, lots of risk on that bid. We tend to put a 20% contingency because we know construction projects have a lot of risk to them. And we've lost the last eight bids. In comes in VRAM, two separate companies, one on RFID tagging for assets, the second on visual monitoring using drones and computer vision for sensors, pulling together to create a digital twin of an entire construction site. We now have that technology on our platform. 
We're using that to bid on hydro turbine refurbishments, and that 20% contingency we had in every bid is down to zero, so we're much more competitive. So that's an example of where we are winning as a result of a startup. A startup has now had their technology validated, um, and they are selling to other companies that are coming through our innovation center as well. Nice. That's great. Uh, Ravi, in the, you've been running three, how long uh, years? Five, five years. Five years. Fifth year, OK. So what is the biggest change you've had to make over the last five years in running the program? And what was it in response to? Um, I told you I'd go off the script. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm trying to think about what's relevant on the corporate side. We've had to make a ton of changes just because we're a company itself. We now have, I mean, we started and we had our first class was eight founders. We now have, you know, 230 companies. So the biggest change that we've made is that we have a thousand mentors and we have to, uh, all the core team, we're an inverted VC. So most VCs, you have, you know, the, the smart money is the GPs, and, 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 and uh, we, our core smart people are all operators, and we're managing a network where all the smart minds are the, the nodes, just because we have to. So that's more of an a, a operational thing. We have this whole vault platform to manage everything. And so we've had to become more, much more of a product company than a service company. But for corporates, I think the big thing that's changed in the last five years is everybody has an innovation hub now within a corporate. So all corporates are becoming... Everybody's interested in Silicon Valley. Everybody's like sending somebody over to Silicon Valley. And uh, I think more than any time in our history have we seen corporates uh, trying to become VCs or, or trying to think about innovation hubs. And you know, I completely agree with what Melinda was saying earlier about the power of how corporates have the assets that the VCs have just been monetizing more effectively. So VCs love funding people that have worked at the corporates for 10 years and then leave. And um, if you look at the data, there's about half a billion or half a trillion that's spent on corporate R&D and it doesn't work or it's not performing well in general. If you look at a lot of the stats, it's not correlated to sales or higher performance. And there's about 50 billion spent on venture capital, which is working well. So I think the things that have really been fun to see that have shifted in the last five years is there's just been this, a huge evolution of hybrid models of thinking about what innovation hubs are doing. Um, that has engendered a lot of flexibility and blurring the lines between where does the corporate end and where does the VC begin, and that's been really fun to see. So one of the things that's you know we have is that we have this initiative called Alchemist X, which is an experiment where we're going to use the accelerator and just bring it in house to try to have not um, ventures that we're going to get funded, but internal initiatives that we're going to be spin-ins that we're going to be adopted by internal business units. And Citrix and Sandisk and Red Hat all did it, and that was a crazy. Experiment, but that was really something that we would never have thought of doing five years ago. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you know the, the evolution is is huge. Melinda, you've been doing this independently for longer than than J Labs has been around. Um, what would you say? So similar question. What has been the biggest change that you've seen over the last little while, and what has it been in response to? Change of corporates and how they're looking at it. Yeah, or the way the general. programs are run, or what they need to be doing. Oh, I think it's a recognition that we need to define talent differently. I think uh, corporates used to define talent as anybody who showed up with an employee label on their head and that's who they cared about mostly and the rest was all just kind of uh, surrounding the edges. And now we need to define talent as anybody who's on the same mission that we're on. Now, you may be, because of your life circumstances and your personality, choose to show up in this stable type of employment relationship uh, that's not a judgment. That's a way people need to live and need to work. But you may prefer the boom and the bust, right, cycle. Now, when you prefer the boom and the bust cycle, you still want to be grounded in the experience and wisdom of a big company. And neither one of those are judgments, right? You just choose to live, live your life differently. So we want to work with all of you. We want to work with anybody who's on that mission. And we're going to support both of you. And however we work together, in one sense, doesn't really matter. So I think how we're thinking about people as our talent has changed dramatically. Okay. Do we have any other questions in the crowd? Yes? One question for Melinda and John. Uh, if you could work for any other company where you feel you could have an even better experience, what company would it be? <laughs> You want to work for Get J &J, even first, right? yeah. <laughs> and, and you can't say Johnson and Johnson. <laughs> yeah. That's a really good question, you know. Um, so I'm an entrepreneur, right? I started out with my, J Labs was my model to start with, and we partnered with J&J, &J, and then they brought us in. 
Um, so it was a real challenge to go from being an entrepreneur to working in a big company. I was really, I had hives about it. Um, and I didn't think I was gonna last that long and, no, and nobody thought I was gonna last that long either. Um, but what I loved about j and is there's actually a lot of entrepreneurs in there. So our chief science officer, first of all, started as an infectious disease doc on the front lines of HIV in Africa. So if there's somebody who understands um, the pain of being a patient, it's him, right? And so he got into being, long story, but got into being an entrepreneur because instead of just treating the problem, he wanted to cure it. He wanted to solve it. Uh, so he became an entrepreneur, which was, ended up being bought by J&J. &J. Um, our new uh, head of pharma R&D is also uh, the original founder of TheraVance, and he started his company as a PhD student in Harvard. And so he totally gets it. He IP IPO'd one company, sold another company. So we've got a company full of entrepreneurs who love entrepreneurship, and they love getting solutions to patients. So it's a, we're a very mission-based company. And so when it comes to what's the right thing to do, we look at that. What's the right thing to do versus you know all the politics. Um, that being said, it's you know it's a different being in a big company than starting from something from scratch on your own, right? When you're in a big company, your stakeholders are your internal group. You're trying to get them to act, right? It's like being on the outside and trying to get VCs to fund, right? You're getting them to fund other things. Um, and so, I don't know, it would be tough for me to go to another big company and have to go through all of that again. Like I don't know that we got an answer here, have we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think there's one, actually, to be honest with you. Yeah, deep in. So, so working for G, it's like working for 10 different kinds of companies, right? Yeah, just, I don't want the, uh, you can do this, you, know, gotta, you gotta come up with an I, answer. White Whale Analytics, right? So they're a small company, they're not even part of our startup ecosystem. They're just inside working with GE on a number of projects. But what's cool about them is an artificial intelligence company. They're working on everything from AI for NHL hockey teams to helping WestJet improve their dispatch reliability to helping the SAGD industry in Alberta optimize team. And the way these guys are growing and their ability to turn the black box of AI into meaningful outcome for customers is amazing. Their sales cycles are this short and they're a team of three guys, one physicist, one data scientist, and an entrepreneur. And it's just phenomenal to see them grow. I'd love to be a part of that team. So the story I love, uh, thank you for an answer. Yeah. The, uh, the story what I love with White Whale. White Whale Analytics, yeah, yeah. Um, just hearing the companies come in and pitch to come into the program, you know, the, the filter a lot of times, it's gotta be a great founder, but it's, it's can this opportunity go from something that can generate millions in revenue to billions in revenue. And I think in Canada, so we have one Canadian uh, you know, uh, program up here, I think Canadians in general just don't think big enough about problems and solutions. And we've actually heard some of the startups come in and they've been asked this question to say, well, this is great, but we've got a, a site with 20,000 wellheads. You know, can, can your software scale to support this? And you know, as a pre an entrepreneur in a previous life, and the answer to that question is yes. <laughs> of course it's yeah, I can, absolutely. And then you go worry about it. But it's interesting because some of the startups who've come in and pitched have, have said, nah, no, it's not really designed for that. And you know, the meeting's sort of over by that point. But you know, helping companies like a White Whale and others come in and really start thinking about what does this small startup that I've created with five or 10 or 15 people look like when it's selling all over the world? Um, you know, Ravi, maybe you've gone through that with, with companies well, we have, as well. Maybe less so in the Valley, but... No, but we... Well, so we have a ton of... We love Canadian companies. Uh, Daniela, uh, who is also the managing director of Alchemist, she was just telling us today we were debating about this one company, and she was like, oh, they're Canadian, we should just take them because they're so <laughs> earnest. And, um, and the Valley, I think, actually, the flip side is that, of this is that there is a trust... Uh, people trust Canadian companies, and, and in the Valley, there's a little bit of jadedness where everybody's building a $10 billion company and nobody really believes it anymore. Um, but I do think that, there, so there is something, I, 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 so there is something around claiming it and owning it, uh, uh, especially if you're creating new markets um, where you need to, uh, but I think, I, I feel like that is something that you can, that's polished, that can be learned um, uh, and, 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 and that you can just sort of go out and, 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 and learn that through, through, through trial and error. Um, I love Canadian companies because I think what's really missing is this mission-driven spirit, and the Canadian companies tend to be more earnest. They also tend to be much more grateful and appreciative than the companies that are sort of born and raised in Silicon Valley and asking, you know, where's my $10 billion acquisition and why hasn't it come? Um, so, 
I, I don't think it's necessarily anything to sort of uh, uh, throw out. Some of our best companies are Canadian. And I, and I think it's a balancing act. I think for all the Canadian companies, you know, you need to at the very least go to the Valley to see who you're competing against because you are competing with those yeah. kinds of entrepreneurs. Yeah, I would say if you come to the, so one thing is just don't be overly, so if you come to, the, the, my, 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 my uh, condensed advice for Canadian companies is don't come to the Valley and say that, you know, you're a Canadian company and, you know, if you get funded, you'll move to the U.S. and focus on the U.S. Uh, uh, if you do, nobody will fund you. They'll punt you to their, to their Canadian partners to assess you. When we have Canadian companies, we tell them to, they go through Alchemist, which is a six-month program, and we show them as, a, as American, as Silicon Valley companies, with the Toronto office or with the you know, Montreal office. And then if they get funded, guess what? They are American companies. So there is the spirit of sort of owning the fate that you want to have occur rather than asking for permission, uh, which needs which is a bit of a shift. I think the assets are in Canada, absolutely. I think it is a problem that people don't want to stand up on a chair and shout that they can do it. Uh, yet in history, we've seen it. We've seen it with Nortel, unfortunately. Whatever, we won't talk about that. Uh, we've seen it with Blackberry Rim, unfortunately, we won't talk about that. Uh, but it's possible. And I think if you look at it, you know why Nortel was really great in Canada is because the engineering talent was so awesome. and. It was cheaper given currency and, and uh, cost of living, et cetera. So I think it is possible, and mark my words, artificial intelligence in health, in cancer, in Canada, it's going to rock here. No D-Wave, D-Wave is a quantum computing company out of Vancouver, which is killing it right now, too, from DFJ. But yeah. So in the minute 24 we have left here, in uh, more than five words, starting with Gandipan, what's the next big trend we're going to be hearing about in the next five years? Uh, you're putting me on the spot. Ravi. Yeah, it's it's uh, something none of us will predict. Yeah. That's <laughs> five words. Uh, Longevity. Living uh, much longer, uh, staying physically younger. I think it's all going to be about aging. Gendi, but what, what did people not know about digital industrial that's already happening? How's that? Uh, I'll tell you that it's already being monetized. Um, you're already using artificial intelligence in industries that are very resistant to that kind of technology. Think about oil and gas, where it's all engineers who deal with physics models. They're willing to hand over their well controls to artificial intelligence, and it's happening today using artificial intelligence to make pipelines safer. It's unbelievable the transformation that's taking place in that industry as we speak right now. So that's pretty exciting. Amazing. All right, well, I would like to thank each of you for uh, input you've had on, uh, on this. I think we've hopefully uncovered a few of the secrets behind these programs. And uh, again, thank you each for all of your time. Thank you. Thank you.